Good morning, Andre. It's great to see you. Good morning, Jason. Very nice to see you. Andre, you're a world-famous economist, and you've done a lot of great things, and everybody knows who you are and has seen your publications. And more than that, you're also a fellow at the Center for Security Policy. But you've done something even more extraordinary in the eyes of many. You worked directly with Vladimir Putin for a number of years, and you got to see a side of the Kremlin that few other people ever get to see. So based on that experience, what can you tell us about Mr. Putin? First of all, it was not my merit. Uh, just I was not looking for getting the job, and it happens uh, in such a way. So that is why um, I stayed for some time, and after that, actually, I resigned. So that is why probably uh, I did not use this historic opportunity for longer than uh, somebody else would do it. Um, as for your question, uh, the uh, most important uh, that people should uh, know about uh, Mr. Putin that he's pretty smart, very concentrated, uh, very well controlled himself, uh, is ready to listen to anyone. This is a, probably the only person in the world that I ever met and I ever talked to who is ready is able and eager to listen to anyone, regardless of their political, ideological, ethical, and so background. So he is, at least when I knew him personally, so he was exactly that person. And from what I can see uh, from his behavior, uh, even years after that, so it looks like he continues to be uh, mostly such a person. And Probably two most important uh, features of his character is first one, consistency in his mindset, in his thinking, in his actions, and at the same time, evolution of his mindset, of his ideology, and his action. And this combination of consistency and evolution probably creates the most important uh, image and picture and character of Mr. Putin. So do you have any anecdotes illustrating how he is as a person? Okay, uh, let's take uh, what exactly in front of our eyes and in front of the world for last, depending, uh, depending on who paid attention to this war, uh, the war that uh, Putin unleashed against Ukraine. Uh, certainly those who uh, are not very familiar with Russia, with Ukraine, with uh, Russian-Ukrainian war, could say that it continues for the last two years and several months. Those who involved deeper know that this war goes for at least 11th year. started in uh, 2014. But those who really studied uh, Mr. Putin well, as well as Russia and Ukraine, recent history, they know that this war goes for at least 21 years. 21 years, this uh, date, um, this term is not usually mentioned, but even by very informed uh, experts. But we need to look into it because uh, the real beginning of the uh, Russian-Ukrainian war or Putin's war against Ukraine is September 17th, year 2003. That day, uh, Putin had the high-level gathering in little town Yisk of uh, Krasnodar region in Russia, where he brought together the Minister of Defense, the head of intelligence, head of foreign policy, um, some other people. It was a, probably the highest uh, gathering uh, of the uh, top level uh, leadership of Russia outside of Moscow, outside of Kremlin, out of, outside of Moscow region, just in that part of the country. And what they were discussing. They were discussing their geopolitical breakthrough in the area of Black Sea and Sea of Azov. And then Putin officially 
for the first time, at least to my knowledge, pronounced that he, Putin, has territorial claims to Ukraine. It is remarkable that this event, that it has been publicly covered very well by the Russian media, it still has all these documents on the website of Kremlin, anyone can look into this, has been completely ignored by any analyst um, uh, who discuss the uh, Putin's plans, Putin's logic, Putin's policy. But as he pronounced once again, in September year 2003, uh, it will be soon 21 year of his official territorial claims to the neighboring country. So that is why it's one of the probably brightest example of his persistence, of his consistent approach. If he decides something, so he continues to do this. At the same time, it is evolution in his approaches. In September, October, year 2003, his primary goal was little uh, island Tuzla in the Strait of Kerch uh, between Ukraine and Russia. It was a Ukrainian territory, and he tried to annex uh, that little uh, strip uh, Tuzla. Later, he expanded his ambitions to Sevastopol, to Crimean Peninsula, to Eastern Donbass, to full Donbass, to the so-called Novorossiya, to the left bank of Ukraine, to the whole Ukraine. And if we read carefully and listen to what he was talking about uh, in his so-called Valdai speech on October 5th last year, and in many other speeches, his ambitions are much larger. He is going to change the world. So that is why we can see that his desire for annexation of someone's territories is still there, but his appetite have been involved substantially. So that's really interesting. But what was his argument? Why did he argue that Russia had a right to expand this territory or that it was necessary? There are many arguments uh, in uh, it he has demonstrated over the years uh, his flexibility to pick up different concepts, different ideas, sometimes uh, contradictory to each other, sometimes completely uh, mutually exclusive. So that is why it is not so important what particular arguments he is using, certainly for propaganda personal counter propaganda persons. We need to understand that. But for them, it is not so important because he's extremely good in uh, picking up uh, different explanations. And it could be starting from the kind of uh, op openly communist to openly anti-communist to claim whatever. What is really important, it's not what is he using for uh, justifying his ambitions and his actions but what are his real goals? So that is why he can uh, claim, okay, uh, Ukraine is a so-called creation of uh, communists, okay, of Lenin, but he would never mention Stalin, that Stalin uh, contributed to, uh, according to his theory, but at the same time, he would find uh, uh, both communists, uh, his, uh, his some kind of, arch enemies, but nevertheless, he's very ready to use what those communists have prepared for him. So that is why, once again, he's incredibly um, flexible and let's put it in kind of completely unprincipled uh, in this regard. So that is why uh, some people are kind of shocked uh, how easy he can talk with whatever far left to the far right. Because for him, this so-called ideological principle or ideological approaches that are still very valuable for many people around uh, around the world, for him are not so important. He has a different approach, not so much ideological, because as I mentioned, he's a, probably the best person that he can talk to anyone, once again, regardless of ideological spectrum. 
he has something uh, different in his mind, which I would say, uh, to some extent, with I, I I don't think that it is his uh, fully his nature, but it's much closer to his real nature. It is a so-called uh, cultural approach in the view of Samuel Huntington. So he can see himself as the leader of the uh, Russian uh, Eastern Orthodox uh, Russian-speaking community, which, from his point of view, is different from not only the Western areas, but uh, Western countries and Western society, but from some other societies. But he thinks that uh, this concept, regardless whether he actually re-read uh, Huntington or anyone else, but uh, he's trying to use this concept or something, the concept that is similar to that, to create uh, some kind of political military uh, security umbrella over those territories and over those people whom he consider his own, so-called. But him as a person and those around him, you got to know them. And I'd be curious what they were like. But... Putin is a person, you mentioned the Orthodox world specifically. Would you say from your interactions with him or what you know about him, would you say he's a deeply religious person or those in his inner circle are very religious? Or is this simply an instrument as a means to an end? Okay, there are also conflicting uh, comments about his so-called religiosity. So uh, uh, I think I believe uh, since I saw it from the very short distance, um, he's, uh, he became... He evolved in such a religious uh, religious person, but his uh, religion is slightly different from many people consider such a religion. So, because many people would consider a uh, very important ethical code that any religion, especially Christianity, regardless of what kind of Christianity, including Eastern Orthodox Christianity, uh, uh, put to the such things like uh, the life. Uh, of person or uh, security or safety of that person, it is not uh, important for him at all. So that is why he developed his own understanding of religion, uh, his own understanding of East Orthodox uh, religion, and he follows his own principle and his own conduct in this regard. Um, so I would say that for him uh, is more important uh, the, that element uh, of Eastern Orthodox religion that gives enormous weight to power, to power of the state, to power of the church. And he sees himself as their envoy sent by higher authorities to this earth to execute the hidden desires uh, of the high authorities. So that is why the only him who can receive signals from the high above, who can interpret those signals, and who can be the main leader in implement, implementing all those signals in, into real policies. And the people around Putin, what are they like? Um, and here it comes to the his second uh, part of his personality, uh, most of those people have changed over these 25 years. Just within a couple of months, we shall have the so-called quarter of century jubilee of Mr. Putin's uh, being in power from August 9th, 1999, when he was appointed prime minister and essentially concentrated uh, most important powers in, in the country. So uh, over these 25 years, uh, he has changed uh, almost everybody in his inner circle, with few exceptions um, of those people who did, uh, who did work for him back then and who do work for him uh, even today. But most of those people are employed in the so-called technical positions. They are not those people who can influence his thinking, his mindset, his decisions. Over the 25 years, the people who really participated in the 
somehow decision-making process have changed dramatically. So that is why one of the lessons that might be, uh, should be learned uh, from analysis of his personality is that he himself is the most important uh, subject of these studies. With all due respect to all others uh, who were around him back then, but definitely much more uh, today, they are mostly of uh, some kind of executioners of his will, of his decisions, uh, of his policies. Hmm. So that's interesting. So as it's changed over time, though, it does seem that his group has become more consolidated. And the number of people that he interacts with on a daily basis has gone down, perhaps, uh, which has led to some to conclude that he's made mistakes, including the invasion of Ukraine, where he was receiving only limited information from a limited number of people that kept telling him it would be easy or that everything was already in place. And based upon that, he was misinformed. What do you think of that? Do you think that's possible? First of all, I would say that um, uh, initially, so kind of just what I was 25 years ago, he did listen to many other people uh, much more attentively because he did not feel himself confident enough uh, to undertake uh, steps in very many uh, different areas of the uh, political life. He was very fresh uh, when he has been appointed prime minister and he was elected as a uh, president of the country. Uh, gradually over these years, he has acquired uh, a lot of experience, uh, personal, psychological, political, uh, diplomatic, uh, security, military, whatever, to such extent that he considered himself uh, the main expert in many areas. So that is why even he still is ready to listen to others. So he came to conclusion that still he is uh, probably number one who understands what he needs to understand. So that is why all this talk about this misinformation uh, I think it would be uh, it would be better to use term self misinformation because mm -hmm. it is based not so much on the reports uh, that some people around him uh, give uh, give to him. So that also can be true, but it is his own belief in himself, and that is why most of the mistakes some experts are talking about him his mistakes. Uh, mistakes that he committed himself, not some other people who misled him, misinformed him, and uh, kind of recommended some wrong actions, with probably a few exceptions. And one of the most dramatic exceptions is a uh, recent downgrading, substantial downgrading of Mr. Patrushev. And that is uh, another feature that confirms his readiness to evolution even today. So he is not fixed uh, neither in his view, in his mindset, nor even uh, with people whom he works with. Patrushev is one of the closest person to him for many, many years. And he's very close confidant. He is a very important um, assistant in the most uh, dark, bloody uh, operations uh, that Putin uh, ordered uh, him to do. Nevertheless, regardless of that closeness, he decided to demote him from the position of the Security Council Secretary. This is the most important uh, change uh, that happened over the last, whatever, maybe 15 years. And re uh, we can remember that before that, Something similar happened with another very close confidant for him, Sergei Ivanov, who was also Security Council uh, Secretary. He was a Minister of Defense. Uh, he uh, then occupied the number two position uh, in the uh, Putin circles. So, and we can see those number twos, it was Sergei Ivanov for some time, it was Dmitry Medvedev for another time, it was uh, Nikolai Patrushev for another time. So he is ready to change even the closest 
of his confidence. So the number two keeps changing. He himself stays there. Well, that's interesting. In the case of Patrushev, though, I would be curious because Patrushev's son, who's the Minister of Agriculture of Russia, remained in place. Patrushev himself is 72 years old. Uh, he's a little bit younger than Putin. But many interpreted his exit as being more of a sign of, let's say, retirement, that he wasn't able to keep up with the demands of the job. Do you think he was demoted? Why do you think that? Um, you know, whether we can say that uh, Sergei Ivanov, whom I mentioned before, he's retired. Yes or no? Because he has demoted from uh, his uh, higher positions, including the head of the presidential administration, the most powerful position in the country after the president. So, but he became whatever member of the Security Council without portfolio, with a portfolio for ecology. All right. Okay. Dmitry Medvedev, he was the uh, former president. Okay. He has been demoted, not only from that position, but also from the position of the prime minister. And now he's uh, some kind of deputy secretary of Security Council. So, and he's now became famous, or to be correctly, infamous for his tweets and comments. Right. Okay. So, who can say that he occupies very important positions? Based on what he's writing, it is very clear he does not have access to the boss. Mm. No doubt. Mm. Otherwise, he would never write such a stupid stuff. As for Mr. Patrushev, so it's too early to say, but uh, looks like um, that's a very important downgrading. Uh, if we look uh, into what he was not so much writing, but he was kind of making comments and in interviews over the last several years. He considers himself as a so-called Mr. Suslov of nowadays. Mr. Suslov was the head, uh, the the member of the Politburo, uh, Politburo of the Communist Party in Brezhnev times, who was responsible for ideology. So that is why he became a kind of uh, ideo ideology person who some kind of. Um, imposed uh, his ideas on the society and on Putin's Kremlin. Mm -hmm. And probably at some point, uh, Putin himself decided that it's probably too much. Not only this uh, element, but also element uh, of, it is my suspicion, uh, based on some facts, it is not fully proven, but nevertheless, uh, it looks like Mr. Patrick was involved in Krokus, a terrorist act and he was one of the most vocal if not the most vocal person who claimed that it was uh the so-called ukraine intelligence operation and we remember that uh putin himself uh for several days claimed that it was a ukrainian operation after that putin became silent and never used all these comments which means, and the, this propaganda campaign that was very active back in March, uh, just a couple of months ago, all of a sudden uh, dissipated. It is ended without any consequences, mm -hmm. which means that Putin looked into the facts, found something that did not satisfy him, Trouble of this operation, uh, he found uh, not successful, not effective, and at some point he punished those or that person whom he considered responsible for that. Hmm. That is interesting. Um, so when you look at the rest of what's going on in Moscow, you see that today, for instance, Russia has designated the United States as being an enemy country at this point. No longer not a friendly country, but an enemy country. I'd be curious, though. You knew Putin back at the beginning of his term when relations with the United States were much better, obviously. And there was a lot of optimism. There was a lot of hope that things would be better for the future. Did you, in your conversations with him, ever get the impression that Putin had an underlying hatred or dislike or distrust, perhaps, of the United States and of Europe. I mean, was all of the current things that we see today, this this uh, vehement uh, spewing hatred towards the West that we come see on Russian television, was this something that you would have seen 20 years ago or predicted seeing? Or is this something that he developed over time? In uh, understanding and analyzing Putin, uh, once again, just we need to have 
these two both elements consistency and evolution and uh in his attitudes toward the west um uh that evolution turned out to be a very different approach you are absolutely right uh, by saying that in the first three three and a half years or uh, four years of his presidency there was no clothe there to West Russian leader than Putin. And it was not only understanding on the Russian side, it was the understanding on the Western side. Uh, there was a very uh, famous saying by Condoleezza Rice, uh, who said once that Russia, for some moment, was closer to the United States, at least to the, uh, her administration, to the Bush administration, than Germany and France. That's a remarkable statement that uh, two closest NATO allies, from her point of view, were far from Washington than Putin. So that's, that's once again, that's a remarkable, that was a honeymoon uh, in relation between uh, United States and Russia. Today, it is something that uh, we cannot find uh, something similar even probably in the worst days of the Cold War. And it is remarkable that it all of that is happening under the same person. So that is why uh, we need to understand that uh, the possibility for changing uh, mindset and approaches uh, is uh, are remarkable, are remarkable in this particular person. And uh what kind of psychological or political calculations are uh, driven uh uh have been used to drive these uh these changes is a matter of uh, very particular study